Thank the Lord. Thank you, brother. We appreciate that song. We appreciate that testimony. Uh, you know, you uh, talking about getting out of the... I just got to tell you, it's good to get out of those miserable 20s, isn't it? I mean, I was, and then I was glad to get out of those miserable 30s. One of these days, I'll get out of these miserable 40s. And we're going to celebrate all the way. Amen? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't believe me, but, it, you know. All right. We are... Are you glad to be in church this morning? Amen. Are you glad to be the church this morning? So you didn't come to a church. You are the church and made this the church. So we're thankful that you're here. We appreciate the spirit with which God is moving in our midst this morning. We don't know what, what He tries to do, but we want to always be pliable in His hands, don't we? We want to let Him move upon us. I know everyone didn't grow up in churches that clap or shout or jump or sing, but we want to have the freedom that as God pushes us and He stretches us sometimes to do things, even lifting a hand sometimes can be uncomfortable for people who aren't used to doing that. But if God prompts you, just you let His Spirit move you because that's what we want to do as we don't want to quench His Spirit in the church of God. Amen? We're in the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter 6 and verse 6 through 8. Please stand for the... Reading of God's Word, Proverbs 6, 6 through 8, it says this Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. Lord, we take these few verses, these few words, and look at the, the weight and the depth of what you desire to say to us today. Open our hearts and our minds, give, give us wisdom beyond ourselves that we might understand your mind and learn what you have for us today. Break that bread of heaven and feed us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. You know, sometimes in this life we get our eyes on the wrong things, don't we? We're, we're looking in one direction and maybe the, the answer to what we're looking for is actually right under our nose, but we, we don't see it. And so, to illustrate that point, I'll tell you a little story about this guy who's crossing the Mexican border on a bicycle and he has two uh, bags balanced on his shoulders and the guard is there at the border and he asks he says what's in those bags and the fellow says sand and so the guard says I want to examine them and he see, so he gets off the bike he puts the bags on the ground he opens them up and and the guard inspects and sure enough he finds sand and so he packs up back the sand up he places the bags back on his shoulder and he pedals the bike across the border. Two weeks later, the same situation happens again. He said, what do you have there? Says the guard. And he goes, sand? He goes, I need to look at it. So he opens the bag, same routine, sets it down, opens it up, looks in it. Surely there's nothing. Puts the bags back together, puts them on his shoulders, heads on across the border. Same results, just nothing but sand. And so every two weeks for six months, these inspections continue. Finally, one week, this guy didn't show up at the border. And so the guard sees him downtown, and he just can't help himself. And he says, you know what? He said, we've been watching you for a long time. He said, there's something that you're doing. He said, we just can't figure it out. You're driving us crazy. He said, we, we know you're smuggling something. He says, I won't say anything if you tell us what you're smuggling. And the guy said, bicycles. It wasn't the sand. See, they were looking in the wrong... It was right under their nose. And yet, they were looking at the wrong things. And God is trying to tell us that if we will just look at what He has said and what He has done and what He has used to teach us, we can learn a lot. Even from these little creatures called ants. He tells us to consider the ants. He tells us to study the ants. He says, you sluggard, consider her ways for the end purpose, as we talked about last week. The end purpose is to gain wisdom, that, that, to live life skillfully. That's what we want. It's why we study. It's why we open the, the Bible. It's why we, we pray. It's why we come together in church. It's why we have Bible studies. It's, it's to gain the mind of God, the mind of Christ, to know His will for our lives. That's exciting to me when, when God speaks and we know that He is speaking and we know that He is doing something. That's exciting. Have any of you had come to crossroads in your life 
and God speaks and you know which direction to go and you know the peace that's there and the power that's there. Anybody else experience that? Where you know what God... See, some of us are here and maybe we're not right with God this morning. Maybe we don't know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Maybe we just grew up in a home that you know, followed Christ. Maybe our parents did, but we ourselves have not yet made that choice. But Christ is telling us, He's speaking to us, He's wanting us to come and to repent and to give our hearts and lives to, to Him this morning. It's not, we don't get to heaven riding on someone else's coattail. And so sometimes we get our eyes on the wrong things and God needs us to focus. God has this everlasting urgency that He has that He wants to reveal Himself to His creation. He doesn't want to remain hidden. He wants to reveal, but He says that we'll be known of Him when we diligently seek Him. And so we have to set our minds to seeking Christ. There was a, a comedian, Jeff Allen, and he, and he said this, and I thought it was pretty funny, that God gave us teenagers so that we would understand what it feels like to create something and then have them deny our existence. The parents will understand that. If you're not a parent, you don't understand that at all if you don't have teenagers. But Romans 1.20, where we have started this investigative process, looking into the creation of God, where it says the creatures, His, His divine order has revealed Himself to us, even His eternal nature and His Godhead. It shows us what He has created, has declared Himself to us and what He is. The Bible, as we talked about last week in Psalm 14.1, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool, because all of creation pleads with us to know God. God has placed it out there in reference to Himself, that, that it would all point us back to His person, His divine nature, His Godhead. And we should understand the complexities of this life and this world and understand what God has given us. As far as the universe is, we are on this planet Earth floating in the middle of space with no strings attached. Everything from the forest seeing telescope to the microscope declares the glory of God. And we know that God has given us His written word and this is what He desires for us to know Him, to, to read His word, to understand His word, to know His mind. But then His word points us right back to His creation. And so we have read here in the book of Proverbs in just these few verses, and He tells us to consider the ants. This small, seemingly insignificant insect that often goes unnoticed in our world, except for when we're trying to get them out of our house and we're calling the, you know, the pest control folks to come over and to spray to get them out. If it, if it weren't for trying to get rid of ants, we probably wouldn't take any notice of ants. But God tells us to. He said there's a lot that we can learn. And even through today, we're going to plunge into some of the characteristics, some of the some of the uh, uh, things that ants do and what they are and what we can learn from that, but it is in no wise exhaustive. There is so much that we would never tackle it. You could almost do a whole series just on these, and the more that I studied and the more that I learned, the more that I realized that. So you guys can do that on your own unless the Lord continues to push in this direction. But as I mentioned last week, the ants are only actually mentioned two times in all of Scripture. One, both in the book of Proverbs, once here in the 6th chapter and the other one in the 30th chapter where he says the ants are a people not strong yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The Bible says to consider her ways. And that's what we intend to do today. We're going to consider her ways. We are going to enroll as we talked about last week into the school for sluggards. As he told us to, he says, go to the ant thou sluggard, consider her ways. So we're going to enroll this morning. We're filling out the documents and we're going to enroll in the school for sluggards for the purpose of gaining knowledge and facts that, we can, th that can then be transformed over into the realm of wisdom. The properly applying of knowledge and facts is wisdom and that's what God wants to do in our lives and only through Him can we have that wisdom. The world gains knowledge and facts and never gets to the point of wisdom. They deny Christ, they deny God, they deny His existence. But they have all the knowledge and facts, but they don't have wisdom to properly apply the knowledge and the facts. I think it's amazing to me that Almighty God would direct our attention to what seems to be a totally insignificant species of an, an ant. 
but he does. I mean, so we ought to sit up and take note. It, it seems like God is telling us that he can speak to us any way he likes. He can, if he wants to use the tiniest of ants to, to preach to us, he can do it if we'll just open our eyes and take note. In verse 7 here, it tells us that they have no guide or no overseer or no ruler. This tells us the first thing that we can learn from an ant. They teach us to be self-motivated. They teach us to, to, it says they don't have a guide, an overseer, or a ruler. And there are, there are no whips in the ant colonies. If you study them, you will not see any, any whips in the ant colony telling these little ants what to do. There are no time cards to punch in the ant colonies to make sure that they're on their task at a certain time. There isn't any mother ants to nag their little neglectful baby ants to get up out of bed in the morning or even to go to bed at night. It doesn't exist in the ant colony. You know, it, there is no one there compelling them to do their chores, to get a job or to make good grades or to do their best at everything they do. There is no mother ant there just nagging them along. They do this all on their own. And see, in the church, we can no longer just sit by and wait for a preacher to tell us what we need to live holy and pure lives. We can no longer just sit by and wait for someone to compel us to go share the gospel. That is what God has placed in our hearts, in our lives. We do that whether a preacher ever says, hey, we need to take on the Great Commission. We're going to start an evangelical outreach. We want to tell the people about Christ. We want to get people saved. We should have that drive inside of us even if it never came from a pulpit. We should have that. The Spirit of God gives that to us and we want to do the work that God has called us to do. We don't need anyone to stand and to tell us what moral purity looks like. We don't have to have anyone tell us what righteousness and holiness looks like. The Spirit of God inside of us will reveal that to us. That's why a lot of people that are in ungodly churches leave the ungodly churches and come to churches who preach holiness of heart and life because something was telling them in their own spirit, in their heart, and in their mind, and as they read the Scripture, they knew that there was more to this thing called Christianity than just going through the motions of tradition. Just coming to a church, singing a few songs, hearing a message preached and walking out the door. There's much more to this. It's a dynamic relationship where the Spirit of God indwells a man, begins to transform and change us radically from the inside out. A new mind, new habits. And because of that, and He also gives us a love for the lost. And when we have that love for the lost, it compels us to go to the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. And when we do that, we see the power of God working in our lives because a lot of those actions are far outside of our comfort zones. Nothing we would do, any of those things, without the Spirit of God in our lives. And yet, the ants do these things and they don't have a ruler or an overseer, a governor. They don't have a mother to tell them what to do. And in the church, there's a lot of things that need done even in the church, even in a church as small as ours, where you the service that is needed to make it function and run to, you know, everything from the children's ministry to the buildings and grounds to everything that takes place. God has given each of us a gift, something we can do, how we can serve others even in the church. And so if God has given you a gift or, or anything, you, you talk with someone and get plugged in and, and do some things. See, the Bible says that in Matthew 20, 28, and even in Mark 10, 45, the same verse says, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. See, we don't come... A lot of people go to church because they want the church to serve them. They're looking for things. They're saying, well, what do they have to offer? Do they have a bowling league on Wednesday night? What about a basketball league? What about a softball league? Are they doing volleyball? What about a card night? Well, maybe not. But people are looking for things. You know, maybe they, maybe they have a an exercise class that the, that the women can get involved in. You know, everybody's looking for things where the church can serve them, but God has called us to be the servants of the world. We should be the ones who, when we come, we're, we're as iron sharpens iron, we are rubbing ideas off of one another to find out how we can minister to this lost world and get souls saved before the soon coming of Jesus Christ, and it's too late for them. Instead of just, it's, there's nothing wrong with having fun. 
That God has given us the joy of the Lord in our hearts. I mean, and, and you can't help but to have the joy of the Lord. And when you get around the brothers and sisters in Christ, you have the joy of the Lord and it just bubbles over. And you have a good time and you have fun. And we're going to do that today, even with the fellowship dinner. And if you came today and you're not from here and you don't usually go here, stay anyway. We want you to stay. We want you to enjoy a meal with us. But God has given us something to do. And these ants have taught us. You know, I was thinking, too, I thought about this that this week, and I, I was thinking, if I went out, when the kids were little, I bought this little ant farm. It was pretty cool, you know, it was a little thin, little thing glass, and you could watch them go in there and do all of these things. And I thought, if I went out and bought several ant farms and strategically placed them around my house, just all over the house, that, that all of a sudden I would wake up one morning and my kids would have breakfast cooked, they would have the coffee on. They would have. I would hear the washing machine running in the background. The trash would already be taken out. I, I was thinking that, that Ashley, the house would be cleaned. Amen. And I would ask, "Is your homework done?" And and they would say, "Yes." And I've even worked ahead. And And then you ask if, if they read their Bible and they'd say, Dad, I did that before I started anything else. Several chapters, whole books are uh, 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 read. See, these ants can teach us a lot. We should do it. We should be self-motivated. Also, in verse 8, the Bible tells us that these ants teach us to prepare for the future. He says, They provided their meat in the summer and gathered their food in the harvest. See, they're forward thinking. These Ants teach us to have foresight. They, they teach us to recognize the times that we live in. They teach us to see the dangers that are up ahead of us. See, we read the scripture and we know what God has taught us. It, but he's not saying just see the dangers in this world. Not, not in this world where we, where we foresee dangers or, or potential dangers and we buy car insurance and we buy homeowner's insurance and we buy health insurance and we buy life insurance and and so we can be prepared if anything happens, but God is telling us that we need to prepare for the things even in the spiritual realm. You know, we check our furnaces as, as winter begins to come on, make sure the filters are right, get them tuned up if we need to. If we cut wood, if we burn wood, we have all of it cut and stacked and ready to go for when the winter comes because we recognize the time that we live in. But what about spiritually? The Bible tells us in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13 all the signs of the time. They said the disciples came to Christ and they said, what will be the sign of your soon coming, your return? He said, take heed that no man deceives you. He said, for many will come in my name and deceive many. But he said, there will be wars and rumors of wars. Nation would rise against nation. There will be earthquakes and pestilence. And that's the world we live in today. And yet the church, it seems, sits idly by for the most part recognizes the signs of the times. We see it all unfolding before us, but there is not anything inside of us that is pro provoking us to go out and to work while there is yet time to work. Jesus said that the, the harvest is white, into, under, is white and ripe unto harvest. He said, but the laborers are few. The world out there needs the church to be the church. The world needs to see us living holy lives. They need to see us not backstabbing one another. They need to see us walking in the light as He's in the light. And when they see that, it'll awaken something inside of them. See, this morning I was on my way here and I was trying to get here a, a, a quite a bit early, but there was a truck in front of me and as it was coming on, I saw a guy get out and he was waving his arms around and he had a, he had a, a, a trailer on the back and it was full of hay or straw one, I'm, I'm still a novice, I still can't tell the difference until I pick the bale up and I know one's heavier than the other one, so forgive me for my ignorance of farming, but he had, one of the two was all over the road and out in the field and they were, the bales were broken and so I pulled up and I was pulling up close to him and I got out and I just went over and I thought, well I'm just going to help him pick these things up he was mad, he, he was cussing, I mean he was calling this woman who had gotten over in his, I don't know what happened because I didn't see it, I just saw the result of it, but I mean it was happening. He, she was, it was a lot of words that you would never, I wouldn't repeat in my private time, let alone from here. And, uh, and so I just began to help him and I went out into the field and I was picking these bales up and taking them to his trailer and, and uh, 
and and I and he said he said a few things and he go, he goes are are you on your way to church? <laughs> I said yeah I am. I said I said but if the church can't be the church outside of the walls of the church, what good are we? And and so as I begin to pick him up, he goes he goes don't pick that one up. It's out in the field. I'll go get it. You got your nice clothes on. I said it doesn't really matter. So I just went out there and picked it up and carried it back for him and put it on there. And and you know it was a quick interaction, but. But I, but I just knew that the Lord was involved because my first instinct was I throw this truck in four-wheel drive, go out around these bales that are on the field and get on to church. He's got this covered. But it seemed like the Lord had something else and it only took a few minutes. And I don't know what impact it would make, but the church has to be the church. And when God speaks, sometimes it seems insignificant. But then I found myself praying for Him the rest of the way here and almost in tears that the Lord would have caused something like that to happen that maybe the name of Christ could be glorified. I don't know what his life is. Maybe he's been around a lot of fake Christians. You know, you just think of all these things and whatever the case is. But, but the Bible teaches us through the ants to prepare for our future, they, that we should see and recognize the time. But it goes on to tell us that they, they prepare in the summer. They prepare in the heat. They don't wait for it to get nice out. They don't wait for the spring or the fall but they prepare in the heat of the day. They prepare when it's not convenient, when it's not comfortable. Because you know, being a Christian isn't always easy, is it? Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's not a bed of roses. People don't always congratulate you and support you for the decision you made to follow Christ. Sometimes they don't like it because you're trying to follow Christ and not a set of rules and regulations. You're breaking away from legalism you're breaking away from that bondage and then your families disown you. Your communities don't like you anymore. They call you fake. They don't, you're not upholding the standards any longer. But God has set you free. And whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Amen? And that's where we want to be is free. And when we're free, we have this ability. There's a freedom in Christ, but then there's this propensity. There's this driving passion inside of us to share the gospel with others. And so Jesus told us in John 15, 18, He said, if the world hate you, He said, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Don't worry about it. They're going to hate you. They hated Him. They crucified Him. They're going to hate you too. we got to prepare for the future. We can't worry about what the world is saying to us. They recognize the time. You see, when you look at the grasshopper, the grasshopper sings all summer long. You hear the grasshoppers out there singing? They just sing all summer long and they play and the grasshoppers take pleasure. But when the winter comes, the grasshopper dies. See, the ant prepares for winter. And as Brother Stephen was so eloquently alluding to this morning, this idea of growing old, and he will be th so thankful to get out of those miserable 20s. I'm telling you, it's just, it, you will be thankful to be in the 30s. And when you get beyond those, the 40, I mean, it's only going to get better. Isn't that right, Brother Roger? <laughs> but speaking of recognizing the time, there's the, the five B's of getting old that will help you recognize the time that you may find yourself in. The five B's of getting old are baldness, bifocals, bridge work, bulges, and bunions. And so, if you have any of those, you know you're recognizing the sign of the times. The next thing we want to look at with these ants and to consider is that the ants, they work together. These ants, if, if one ant finds a blessing so large that he can't move it on his own, he goes and gets help. And so I want you to see this picture. I think it's, it, 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 a picture is worth a thousand words sometimes. And you guys probably are saying, okay, so you can skip a few paragraphs. <laughs> Speaks for itself, dismissed. But if one ant finds a blessing so large that they can't carry it themselves, then the others come alongside and begin to help carry that for them. And when one ant has a burden, because we don't know if this is a blessing or a burden, but if you have a burden that you can't carry yourself, see the other ants come alongside and help bear that burden. Isn't that a picture of what the church should look like? That we bear one another's burdens and we so fulfill the law of Christ? 
But if there is a blessing to be had that we don't begrudge one another, we don't let jealousy enter in, we don't, we don't hate on each other, we don't care, we, we actually care and are appreciative and are thankful that our brothers and sisters are blessed by Almighty God. Amen? We don't fight against each other. No wonder God told us to consider the ants, huh? Some interesting other things about ants are they are the animal with the largest brain in proportion to its size. Ants. They're known to be the smartest species of insects with over 250,000 brain cells. Ants make up one-tenth of the total world animal tissue. One-tenth ants make up. Their total biomass is roughly equal to the total biomass of all the people on earth. Ants. Could you even believe that? It's crazy. Ants can carry up to 5,000 times their body weight. They're extremely strong and powerful little creatures. And God is telling us through Him, we can bear the burdens as a Christian that we could never bear in the unsaved world. When the Spirit of God lives inside of us, we can handle things that we could never handle apart from Him. See, in agriculture, the ants use sophisticated horticulture techniques to enhance crop yields. Long before Purdue University came along, ants were doing the work that they're trying to mimic now. They secrete chemicals with antibiotic properties to inhibit mold growth. They stop decay on the food that they've gathered. They put, the, they, they put these chemicals on there. They have these antibiotic properties so that they can inhibit the mold growth. And God is trying to tell us when we have growth, when we gather things, we don't gather them so that they can mold. We gather them so that we can be a servant to the body of Christ. We gather those things so that we can be ministers to this world. God blesses us so we can be a blessing to other people. He didn't. It's not get all you can and can all you get. It's, it's get what God gives you and then as He desires us to be a blessing to others, we become a blessing and, and an avenue, a conduit, if you will, for this world to receive blessing from what God has given us as the church. That's what the church is for. You realize that ants have incredible warfare techniques. These ants will engage in combat for hours or for days, even weeks. They will not give up. They are determined. They are programmed to do battle when battle is necessary. They don't get wore down. And God is trying to tell us we're not to get wore down. If the battle only takes a few hours, then fight a few hours. But if the battle takes a few days, then you got to fight a few days. And if the battle takes some weeks, you got to fight for weeks, but sometimes the battle goes for months and years. And sometimes the battle rages and we got to get on board with one another. And when that battle is so strong, we have to come to the family of God. And we got to say this burden is too great. I need some help to fight. Would you come to an altar with me? Would you pray with me? Would you fast with me? Would you, would you go to the throne of God with me? Because I need help. I can't seem to overcome this one thing. Or maybe I've overcome this. Maybe it's something else, whatever the burden is. But God has given us an example that this is what the church is supposed to look like. That we're supposed to be there for one another. We're supposed to put other things down and lay them aside and come to the rescue of our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is what the family of God is supposed to look like. Amen? Amen. Ants are incredible soldiers. Not only with head-to-head -head combat, but they also use psychological warfare. This is something that you wives need to quit doing. But that's another sermon. The psychological warfare is totally not biblical. So, so all you wives cut it out. There are, there are uh, Amazon ants out there. These are just some facts about ants. There's some Amazon ants out there. When they go to battle, they even take slaves from the colonies that they overcome. The ant's force of numbers and their organized aggression have made them the greatest insect killers on earth. Sometimes even of their own kind. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? See, the church should fight our battles together, but we shouldn't be devouring our own. We should be lifting a hand out, not pointing a finger down. We should be trying to lift somebody up, not step on them and push them on down. 
even when they've hurt us, even when they've said things about us. The goal isn't to, to win an argument. The goal isn't to show that we're right and they're wrong. The goal is for reconciliation. The goal is to show the love of Christ. The goal is to bring someone who may not be right with God or you can sense things in their life that may not be. But you want to raise them up. We want to pray for each other. That's why the Bible says pray for our enemies. Sometimes we find our enemies right in our own homes, don't we? Right in our own communities. And sadly enough, they sometimes show up in our own church buildings. But yet we want to not respond and kill our own, but we want to raise up our own and heal our own. Ants come and have super colonies. There are ants that have little colonies, and then there are ants with super colonies. The largest super colony is in Southern California. It stretches 600 miles, one colony. And so God is telling us it doesn't matter if you're a little church or a big church, if you're a little colony or a super colony. It makes no difference. It's how you live. It's are you preaching the word? Are you living the life? That's what matters. It doesn't matter your size. And then there's this group of ants called honeypot ants. I thought these were fascinating little creatures. Honeypot ants. If you can see this picture of these honeypot ants, they hang from the roofs and they have these big honey pots underneath them attached to their bodies. They'll hang from the roof of the den and they have collected this food for a long time. And when scarce times come, when there's not much food, and when there's, you know, in our lives, when there's too much month at the end of the money, there's not enough money to pay the bills, we run into rough times. See, the hungry ants will come by underneath here and they'll rub their antennas on these little honey pots and they'll send a signal and these honeypot ants will feed the hungry ants and take care of them with the food that they've stored up. That's a picture of the church. That's what we're supposed to be. It's what we're supposed to do. But, you know, the other message here is they had to come by. They had to send the signal. They had to rub their antenna on the honeypot to let them know that they had a need. And the same is in, true in the church. If you have a need, you have to let somebody know if you need help. There's no shame in that. We're all going to go through some things from time to time where we need something. We all need prayer from time. None of us are on this, are spiritual giants to the point that we never need someone to pray for us. I need your prayers. You need my prayers. There's no shame in that. None of us reach the plateau where we're so great or we're so mighty or we're so holy that we could never fall, we could never stumble, that the enemy could never get a hold of us. Oh, we believe in sanctification. We believe in the power of God. We believe in transformed lives. But we need prayer. We need to lift one another up. The family of God is, is for that. And so this picture of the church, Philippians 2.4 tells us, to, says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We don't just look at our own well-being, but we look at the well-being of those who are around us. we got to get rid of having shame. See, if these little ants that were starving didn't go by and rub their antennas on these honey pots, they never would have sent the signal that they needed help, they needed food. And so in the church, if we need help, we have to say something. Find somebody you trust. Find somebody you can confide in. I don't care in the church. Sometimes people say, well, there's cliques in the church. There's groups in the church. Things like that. You know what? Sometimes that's okay. Sometimes God just makes us to where we mold one in, in, with certain people in different ways than other. It doesn't mean that we're trying to exclude anyone because we don't live that kind of life. We welcome everyone with open arms. But you do have people that you just mesh better together with. It's just the way life is. It's not a, a bad thing necessarily as long as we're not excluding as a result. And so, but you have to let somebody know if you do have a need. That's the message here. And so, there's a story of this vision that a man had. And this man went and he saw this vision and he saw a group of people in heaven and he saw a group of people in hell. And before both groups of people, there was this banquet table that was spread and it was so eloquent and it had every desirable food that there was known to mankind spread out on this table. I envision it something like what we're going to see as we exit here today and go over here. And I'm, we're going to cut this short if we keep talking about that. Lord, help us. We want to say all you want to say, Lord. 
But I smelt that food coming in this morning, and it was pretty good. I, I saw Sister Peg's three-tiered cupcake holder and carried that in, and it really made me want to cut this short this morning. But we're going we're gonna to be disciplined this morning. But this man sees this vision, and the tables are spread. And the, the most fantastic delicacies that mankind has ever known was spread on these two tables. And he looked, and, and the people in hell were so, so miserable, and the people in heaven were, were so joyous. And, and he looked, and he saw their arms. They didn't have hands, but they had these chopsticks that were for arms, and they were three foot long. And as he looked at these chopsticks for hands, he began to observe what was taking place in heaven and what was taking place in hell. And see, in heaven, what was taking place was they could reach out and they could take hold of that wonderful food and take it up, but they couldn't put it in their own mouth. But what they did was they fed the person next to them. And that person would then in turn feed them and they would share. But in hell, they were so so selfish and so self-centered that they never even crossed their mind to share with their neighbor. And so they all were starving and were miserable with all of this bounty sitting before them, but they couldn't get it because they were so self-centered. That's what the church is supposed to look like. We're supposed to help one another. The world is all about their self, but the church is about family, the family of God. Amen? Matthew 7, 12 says, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. The next point I want to make about ants is that they are survivors. This is the final point of this morning's message. Ants are survivors. They fight and they survive. See, during flood seasons in Asia, these massive columns of ants, sometimes a quarter of a mile long, will combine themselves into this watertight ball. They will join themselves together in this watertight ball and they'll hold on to one another with all of their strength. And this column will float on the surging wave because it's a flood. A flood is coming. They gather together. They, they just hang on to each other and they ride the waves of the flood until it's over and they are on dry land once again. There's a picture of one of those right there. That's a small one. They hold on to each other. They cling together and they ride the storms of life sometimes a quarter of a mile long. Can you even fathom seeing a, a ball of ants that large? But they hold on to one another. They help each other. And see... The church had better learn to stick together. There's going to come a day and an hour and probably not far off where we're all we're going to have. The world will at one point in time, and I don't know when that time is, but the world is going to turn against the church. Not only is the world going to turn against the church, but a lot of churches that claim to be the church are going to turn against the church. It's the way that it is. The Bible already foretold it. It's going to happen at some point in time. And so we have to learn to to stick together as the church. Amen? This is just a picture today. This is just a snapshot of what God is trying to teach us what the family of God should look like. And so I would just ask you this morning, are you part of the family of God? If you're not, you can be. But you can't just be part of the family of God by association. You don't just show up to church and you're now part of the family of God because you attend regularly. You have to repent. You have to ask for the forgiveness of Almighty God. You have, to, you have to acknowledge that first you're a sinner and repent of those sins and turn from those sins. And you just follow Christ. It's really that simple. It's not that complicated. He will come in and He'll change you. He'll do the work that needs to be done inside of you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You this morning for this opportunity to sit at your feet and to learn of you. We realize that Solomon was the wisest among men, but, O oh Lord, we have a greater than Solomon here in our midst, the Holy Spirit that teaches us and guides us into all truth. 
We thank you, Lord, that you have loved us enough to discipline us. You've loved us enough to put a finger on some areas of our lives that we're not doing as well as you would like us to be. And so, Lord, I pray that you would make the church the church. And I don't only mean Radiant Life Ministry. I mean the church as a whole. That the family of God would really be the family of God and we wouldn't be separated by a sign that sits out front that has the name of a church on it or by the walls that encompass a body of believers. But Lord, that we would truly love one another. That those who are building the kingdom, you said, those who are not for us are against us. But if, we're, if we see those out there working and gathering for you, we know that they're on our side. And so, Lord, we encourage and pray for the churches around Kokomo and Indiana and the United States and even the world. We don't segregate or separate ourselves, Lord. We pray for them. We pray that the gospel message would go out. They'll reach people we'll never be able to. Lord, you bring amongst our ranks those who you have already foreordained, those who you, you have called, those who you have wanted to be part of Radiant Life Ministry. We pray that you would bring them. Bring them by the hundreds or the thousands or only the few if that's what it is. Lord, we just ask for your will to be accomplished and us to truly be the family of God. And Lord, as we desire now even to share a meal with the family of God, we pray that those who may have come in and didn't bring anything would feel comfortable to come and to share a meal with us. That we've been a loving church, that we've extended the right hand of fellowship. And Lord, we pray now even for those who have prepared this food, we pray for the food. We pray that you would bless it. Let it nourish our bodies. After this song of invitation is given and we're dismissed, Lord, we are, we are thankful for what your hand of provision has given. And yet, Lord, as good as that food smells and we know the, the quality of our cooks and our kitchen staff, if there is a soul that is weighing in the balance this morning, if there is a man, a woman, a child who needs to get right with you, Lord, we want to postpone everything that we're about to do. We want to allow them to come to altars of prayer. We want to pray with them. We want to get them right with you this morning. Oh God, we want to join hands. We want to be the family of God. We don't point a finger of condemnation, but we reach out a hand to lift them up. And so Lord, if you've spoken to any heart this morning, maybe there's lost loved ones in the lives of those who are here today and they just need to come and to pray. Lord, for whatever reason you call us to altars of prayer, we're not to be the judge. We just pray for freedom in this place today to do what you want us to do. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all the people said, 